Hey, Jack. Hello. Look, everything's gonna be all right. I know. No, it ain't. I'm lying to make you feel better because you're just a kid. What does that mean? Meow. It means reassuring videos when things are grim. However, this is not a good thing. Everything is fine. There is nothing to worry about. Denial is common in the face of terrible events. So let's bypass politics and use science and resources to look at what we actually can do realistically if humanity decides to commit species suicide by a nuclear war. This video is the fourth in a series of videos and this is the last one based upon a CDC 2018 presentation on actually how to increase the numbers of people who survive and don't get injured during a catastrophic 10 kiloton dirty bomb going off in Washington DC. In this, the final video, first off, I've changed it around a bit. You're going to get the question and answer session. Then his discussion about resources that he's got available. And then some slides I'm putting into it. Let people in. Yeah. Do not lock them out. Um, and, and actually, decon is a lot easier than you might think. You know, we actually did a lot of tests in the Nevada desert. And in our infinite wisdom, they actually had soldiers running around 30 minutes after the detonation and the fallout. Dry, dusty environment. The decon procedure, broom. This is dirt and debris. And so they brushed the soldiers off, they measured them, and verified that they were clean. Externally inhaling alpha, beta, and or gamma particles is bad. Avoid making dust or burning wood that was growing when the fallout fell. Think about stuff that's outside. Is there a dust on it? Wear N95 masks, wear goggles, wear gloves, wear waterproof clothing if you are going to be involved with dust. It just makes sense. Remember, this is an ongoing contamination risk. You're going to get exposed over and over again if you're out in the world after a nuclear war. Again, Preparedness Veteran from United Kingdom has some really good videos on all this stuff and I do suggest you check his channel out. He's not doing it for clickbait or sensationalism and he actually knows what he's doing and he actually has the equipment to show you. While a full CBRN suit may not be available for you and your kids, the principles behind what he's showing actually will work and actually transferable. So this isn't like a sticky residue that you're not going to be able to, to get off. Fallout is easy to remove. And in fact, when you look at the, the, uh, the, the old civil defense, they say, take your head off, and you see the fallout coming off of it. But yes, take your shoes off, take your outer layer of clothing off, uh, and that will remove most of the fallout. And the important thing to think about here is that, remember that rapid decay? The fallout's most dangerous early. So getting it off fast is more important than getting it off thoroughly. So don't wait in line for the shower. Whether you're equipped with a CBRN suit or not, try not to go out early in a fallout situation to get gear and equipment. When you do think it's time to go outside, you've got very brief periods of time, act and move gently, try not to kick up dust, be very cautious about what you're taking and what might be on the surfaces of what you take. If you can, wear waterproof boots and waterproof clothing. Again, temperature might be very cold or it might be very hot, depends. But wear the most resistant to dust getting into the fiber clothing that you can. Have an N95 on, put a bandana over the N95. It doesn't have to be really tight. This is for dust protection, okay? Not micro aerosol germs. So really have that kind of stuff on with the goggles. When you leave, when you come back, shed everything. The last thing you shed, 
will be the N95. The N95 you'll shed inside the shelter. And you may have to reuse all of this gear. A great question, and look, I think we've all been involved in exercises where there's a toxic material release, and it's like, okay, the response is over. All right, where's EPA? We'll hand it off. You know, it's really important to begin that recovery process when the event occurs. If you're in emergency management, please consider standing up that recovery-focused IMT almost immediately. IMT is referred to incident management training, I believe. For you as an individual, this also makes quite a lot of sense. Just burning through everything you've stored up for the apocalypse and then having nothing to help rebuild some sort of life after the survival and response phases isn't necessarily a great idea. So think about the future as much as you can whilst thinking about how to stay alive in the present. They need to be thinking about things that will save lives and sustain lives while people are being rescued because that recovery slope is overlapping with the response slope. So how much response will occur if there's a full nuclear war? Well, I have no idea and I hope I never find out. But I'm fairly sure in the first 24 hours there will be a response. People will respond. People will go to the ambulance stations. They will go to the fire stations. Policemen will show up and they will go into areas that are peripheral to where the bombs have hit and try to rescue people from buildings. But it's going to dawn on people the world as was has gone. And it's probably not going to be that long before people stop showing up, stop trying to save strangers. And any help, any support you get is going to just disappear. I do believe a nuclear war will present an opportunity for a new species to arise at some point in the future that is intelligent and hopefully won't be as short-sighted and as suicidal as humanity. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope we can come through this period of our history and emerge on the other side more peaceful and more future-orientated than we are currently. There are a number of great documents that I would refer you to. The, the Nuke Rad Instant Annex is out there, as well as the, the federal planning guidance. And all of these offer you some suggestions on where to go uh, to help the recovery process succeed. <sighs> From a full nuclear war scenario, there won't be any response or recovery that's effective for decades, possibly centuries. Just to put it into context, a 10 kiloton was used for our improvised device planning because that's about the same size as our first nuclear device, Trinity, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, all sort of in that factor of two range of a 10 kiloton. This is the Trinity explosion. Prove the concept, and the concept was then used to end the war with Japan. If nuclear weapons are used again, they very well might end humanity, as we now have a lot more of them, and they're a lot more powerful. I'll remind you that our first nuclear weapon Trinity was a implosion device, highly technical, it worked. Our second nuclear device was Little Boy. It was an entirely different design. It was a gun assembled device, which we used in warfare for the first time and it worked. Answer is not the technical challenge, there's not an overwhelming technical challenge. What we try to do is prevent people from getting the fuels that are necessary, which is the highly enriched uranium and plutonium, which is why we have such a strong non-proliferation effort out there. Also, as for size, uh, within seven years of our first nuclear weapon, we were firing them out of artillery shells. Which is unfortunate. The power is beyond comprehension, and in a tribal world, could well be deadly. In the description, there are some resources that go beyond these videos for you to look at if you wish. There's a couple tools that DHS is developing to help you. This is called the Rapid Hazard Assessment Tool. And instead of, you know, these detailed models, this one is just a simple put down a pie wedge Bad stuff's probably going to be going in this direction. Basically, they're using the nuke map, and I suggest that you actually get familiar with that and the effects of that in your local area. Knowing prevailing winds at ground level and prevailing winds above ground level at the three mile, two, five mile area above the, your city will actually give you a fairly good idea of where the cone of radiation is going to be, even if you have no Geiger counter. If you want to plan, if you want to prepare for an event like this, there's a great tool called the City Planning Resource that FEMA has put together. And across the U.S., we've looked at all major cities, identified what the predominant weather patterns are of, of concern, done a, a variety of, of yields to look at uh, the response needs, and built reports and analysis and GIS systems that allow you to put together a plan that's informed by good analysis and science. This unfortunately is still being better tested four years later and is restricted. You have to sign up and ask for it. I'm not altogether sure I feel like doing that, but if you want to, give it a go. But here now are some slides that were included behind the video for the conference, and also some other slides I put in that are from the links that you might find interesting. Remember, you can always 
pause on a slide and read it in detail or not. It's your choice. Here is a special and urgent message for you. This is Howard Viken, your official civil defense announcer. Civil defense authorities have determined that it is advisable for all persons to leave the city. Your safety and perhaps your life depends on remaining calm and following these instructions. Do not attempt to cross town. Leave the city immediately by the shortest route. Absent members of the family will rejoin the family after they leave the city. Federal authorities have indicated an enemy air attack is probable. We are not certain that it definitely will come here, but there is a chance that we will be attacked. Follow these instructions. So finally, some more screenshots of stuff that is available, and again, it is in the description. Put your emergency supply of food, clothing, bottled water, medicines, and first aid supplies in your car. Load all the members of the family that are at home now into the car and leave the area. Don't try to telephone anyone. Drive on the shortest possible route to get outside the city. Travel at least, I repeat, at least 50 miles from the city. Do not attempt to cross town or drive across roads being used by others as they leave town. Follow civil defense road signs and directions. Your car radio should be... Well, a cliffhanger. I sincerely hope all of these videos are pointless. If time allows, I might do one that actually will just be a bunch of pictures of uh, civil defense stuff from England and elsewhere around the world and America and include some of the radio advertisements and other sources of material and information. Although it's from the 1950s and 60s where they produced most of the material, it's actually got quite still a lot of relevance and I think it's important to just be knowing what's going on. It's not something that we can cope with, it's not something society will, will be able to survive. But if a nuclear war happens and you happen to be lucky and you happen to survive, you owe it to your species to try and survive and make good in a world that's going to be very different. And hopefully, if we do this act of mutual suicide, we can actually then create a different world afterwards, generations from now. It will be a nicer, happier world. Stay safe. Toodles. There's things that can help. I hope you think about, you know, a little bit of preparedness because... Just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of preparedness can save a lot of lives. Thank you. This has been a 2022 Sleepy Wolfie production.